Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Education, Queen Anne's County work session for January 13, 2021. Stand for pledge. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I have a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. 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 Uh, no discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Have the board members had a chance to review? Uh, Point the of order, sir. We also have approval of minutes for January 6th. That's what I'm getting ready to do right now. Got it. Approval of minutes for January 6th, both open and closed sessions. Have the board members had a chance to review those? Yes. Yes. Have a, a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we'll go into presentations. Uh, So at the last board meeting, uh, the group talked a bit about the clay target teams that had presented a proposal for some a team from Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And Ms. Carla Pullen, our chief um, operating officer acting, and Dan Harding, our AD and assistant principal for Ken Island High School, also serves as the chair for the uh, MPSSAA, um, is going to share where we left off last year and uh, what needs to be done at this point. Yes, thank you. Good evening, President Smith, members of the board, and Dr. Kane. My name is Carla Pullen. I'm the interim chief operating officer. As Dr. Kane said with me this evening is Mr. Dan Harding. He is the assistant principal and athletic director at Ken Island High School. And on the phone, I believe we have Mr. Sean Connolly, who is the coach that is initiating the proposal for this presentation. So we're here this evening to discuss the proposal to initiate a clay target league at Ken Island High School. I'm going to give you a little bit of information about the sport, courtesy of the Maryland chapter of the USA High School Clay Target League. Mr. Harding will then share information specific to our team and the affiliation with the school, and we'll open it up for some questions, and Mr. Connolly hopefully can assist. So clay target sports. Clay targets are round or clay ceramic discs. They're thrown into the air. They hit at different angles and then the goal is for the shooter to attempt to hit the target with a shot. And a shot is essentially multiple BBs that are in a single shell and they're fired from a shotgun. The competition consists of a variety of a different number of rounds, and there is an official who's assigned to each of the fields that will verify and that will count the number of hit targets. There are four different types of shooting activities. We have trap shooting. We have skeet shooting. We have sporting clays and a five stand field. The season lasts from March to about mid-June. The competition and competitors travel to uh, shooting ranges or there are even virtual competitions that can be held during COVID. There are also year-end tournaments. The way clay shooting is scored is that all athletes shoot two rounds, so that's 50 targets. And then the top 75, per 80 per, 75 to 80% of that team's scores are then used. The athlete scores are compared against the entire conference, and then our athletes are ranked both individually and as a team as a whole. The U.S. High School Clay Target League has been in existence for 19 years. They've had over 80,000 participants, over 600 million shots, and they note that there have been zero injuries within that time. 
This presentation is linked into the presentation on our board docs. So if anyone is looking for additional information about clay targets, please see that link. At this time, I want to turn it over to Mr. Harding, who is going to discuss the specifics about our affiliation and a team with Kent Island High School. Thank you. Let's see. All right, so as, as discussed, the purpose for being here tonight or this evening is to provide an overview of the request uh, from the community, Coach Donnelly, um, or Sean Do Connolly, and um, to discuss any logistics or questions you will have about the formation of a Ken Allen High School clay target team. So some of these were already discussed. I'll, I, the, the team would be part of the USA High School Clay Target League. The Maryland has its own chapter. Uh, the high school, they do require that there's one sponsoring school. And so it was requested that Kenown High School uh, would, would serve in that purpose. Um, currently, there are four private schools in the state of Maryland that are participating. Uh, they do anticipate it getting, getting larger, but right now that's what they have. Uh, we would look uh, and have, have spoken to Sellersville Trap and Skeet. Uh, that's that's where we are, would plan to uh, practice and compete uh, and turn in our virtual scores. I, I believe the team could be open to middle school through high school, but to keep things kind of as a high school team and, and much simpler, we would look to open it to grades 9 through 12, and that's helpful for, for many reasons for us. Um, as mentioned before, Mr. Sean Connolly, uh, really with the assistance of uh, many community members, but to include the Queen Anne's County 4-H, um, would, would be able to provide firearms. The thought is most of our students that are interested will have their own firearms. Uh, though if, if, you know, he said to me in a recent conversation, he wouldn't want students trying it out for the first time and rushing to go purchase firearms. There, there's, a, there's a safe way to um, either, I don't think it was rent, but be on loan from either 4-H or other, other coaches uh, so they can kind of get a get a full picture before they look to purchase their own. Um, and if they aren't able to purchase their own, that wouldn't be a hurdle as well. The practice and competitions, um, I believe this still to be accurate, but we can ask we can ask just to clarify. It would be held on Saturdays. I, I know the, at the when we held an interest meeting prior to uh, uh, COVID hitting, the, the, the talk was that we would offer multiple days throughout the week and the results had to be turned into the league I want to say by Saturday at noon, and then those were virtually tallied, and that's who would determine a winner. And then under a normal circumstance, the, the season results would be tallied, and there would be a mid-Atlantic or a Maryland competition, and then there would be a nationwide competition, and that's how they would be scored at the end. Uh, Ms. Pullen commented on the safety based on, you know, uh, that really they, they tap their, it's the only high school sport in the, in the country that has, has zero injuries. Um, though I think important to note too is to participate, you have to take their safe certification course uh, and or have a current um, hunter safety license and uh, the um, Southersville Skeet and uh, will, will require us to go through a process as well. They, they actually, by, by hosting us, would take on quite a bit of liability. There, there are factors within their own professional organization they'd have to do to host the team as well. Um, certainly the biggest concern I, I think that we all would have would be firearms or, or any, any uh, paraphernalia of that on school grounds. And I would say that uh, from the beginning, this whole group was very big on saying absolutely it, it would be at home. They have a, a specific way they would transport it uh, to keep it away from. The, the students uh, that, that, that you know one of the things that they would they would guarantee us is that there is never going to be a question as to whether or not you should bring a firearm or into school onto the campus that's a no it's, you know the practice would happen ap after school and th so those things would be left at home or perhaps even stored at Southersville uh, so that they would go and use them there the league itself has a ratio of one coach to every 10 students, so you, you're not allowed to have more than uh, 10 students for one coach. We, we Not we believe, what, what I'm being told is we would be able to accommodate um, with the multiple coaches we have ready to volunteer, I believe up to 40 um, student athletes for this team in the beginning, which I would tell you is a pretty large number for a, for a team starting out. Um, 
the both the facility and the league are insured and like I said have have all the proper protocols in place. So the cost, which could be a little staggering when you look at it, is $283 per student. Uh, just like most, if not all, of the club activities that have been presented in my nine years at the high school, they're not asking for any funding from the school system. They simply want to be afforded the opportunity to do so. Um, and they feel they can offset some, if not a lot, of that per student cost, if need be, by fundraising. Now this, again, COVID may, may have played a, a little bit of a, a hardship in this, but before that they, they were starting to develop clear plans as to what they could do and I would tell you in that interest meeting they had some some good ideas on how to lower that that per student uh, participation cost um, as I just mentioned no direct cost to the school and some other opportunities uh, for additional costs are there but they're, they're minimal can I ask a question real quick? Yes. About the cost. Yep. Um, you're going to have a lot of students already come with their hunter safety license, so does that reduce their cost? Yes. Yes. If they previously have it, then they don't need to go through it again, and they wouldn't absorb. You know, so that 283 included that that cost. So you're right. It would be cheaper. Um, so there were a few logistical issues, and I, I think we're still working through them. Uh, Mabe had requested a increase of the league's insurance from a million to two million in liability. Um, the league had has responded back in an email and said that they believe their one million is sufficient. So we'd have to decide whether we we agree with them or seek some further insurance. Also, there was a uh, may requested just that the board review the league's sexual abuse and molestation policy. They have one. It's just you know they thought thought it'd be prudent that that you guys put your you know eyes on it and and said whether or not that. Uh, coincided with the board's uh, view. Transportation, uh, we, I, I kind of took a look just like many of our other clubs, whether it's our sailing team at Kent Island or our ice hockey ice hockey team that are similar in, in nature perhaps. Uh, many of the parents and, and athletes transport themselves, though in, though in certain occasions in ice hockey, we do provide a bus, not currently, but, but pre-COVID, we provided a bus once a week for practice because the students were going over to the Naval Academy. We just thought it was safer if they got on a bus. Uh, and then we have, uh, for many of our um, clubs, utilize buses for competitions and championships. So if they qualified for that Mid-Atlantic or the National, we would look to support them perhaps with a bus if it made sense. And we've done that with sailing uh, most recently. Um, and then simply just to kind of keep things uh, above board, we, we would look to have an MOU written between the Queen Anne's County Public Schools and the team and league, which... Uh, they're readily available to do. And, I, and actually, the coach has already uh, created one. Can I ask a question about that? Yes. See, seeing that it's off-site of a, a school, um, would it, w do we have an MOU with the skating rink that the ice hockey p plays on? Would we need to have one with the Southersville skeet shoot? I'm on a way. I, yeah, I have to check on that. Uh, that would I will. be something I would. And the MOU issue is something that we're still working through. Okay. We want to make sure that we have all of the, the appropriate parties involved in that. And definitely with this facility. Yes. The, because the facility is separate from the league itself. The correct. Mr. Harding, were you saying that the. Um, Suttlersville, that cost included the time that was spent training at the Suttlersville ski. I want to clarify that uh, with Mr. Conley, but I believe so, yes. And on your interest meeting, how many did you have there? Do you approximately? Yep. Sean has the okay. sign in list because he used it to communicate with, but but I was there and it was I mean our media center was uh, filling up nicely. So I'd say there were there were forty to sixty. I'm not sure who signed up on the the list as to being being interested. Some of those students unfortunately um, have graduated because again we were looking at potentially starting a spring season last year, uh, but many are are still there. I'm sure there's some we're not even aware of that would perhaps be interested. Mr. Harding, as I understand it, last year. It was going to be Ken Allen High School and Queen Anne's County High School. Are we not offering it to both high schools? I believe that's still a possibility. The, the league was just asking that one entity, one school, sign as the sponsor. Um, okay. I think there is flexibility. Again, Sean can best answer that, uh, and or I can reach out to the, to the Maryland chapter okay. and ask. But I, I do believe we were okay with 
um, mixing. Uh, the, the concern could be if there are simply too many students interested, Queen Anne's may need to pick up their own just so that we're not overloading the, the coach for that ratio, one to 10. And Mr. Connolly, if you can hear, yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I am on the line, and uh, yes, I can I can answer that question. We would uh, be open to having uh, students from Queen Anne join the club, uh, and let them know that there was a requirement for some paperwork uh, between the schools, so they're not um, kind of feeling their assholes. Um So as long as the support that they don't currently have. Uh, there would be an understanding between the two clubs, which is the two schools that we were allowed to do from there. And if there's enough interest in Queen Anne, they could, you know, I'd certainly be willing to help them start their own team as well. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. And I would say that is directly in line with, with how the um, ice hockey team got started. It was a composite team years ago, and as it built up in numbers to be strong enough to have two, they amicably split and now... And if it's a composite team, how did you do that? Were they Ken Island High School or Queen Anne's, or was it just a Queen Anne's County Public School team? It was a Queen Anne's County Public School team, okay. um, which those things happen. Uh, you know, Ken Island High School could still be on record as the sponsoring school, and then we would come up with a clever name to just incorporate both as long as it met within the league rules. Um, you, you mentioned it, it could be a possibility for tournaments and stuff of bus. With, and makes sense for the students getting on that. I would highly suggest that never a gun would be on a bus. That it would be it would be put on a separate van or car. Yeah. In you know, everybody that has a gun will have a gun case or something like that. Um, that because the bus is leaving the school property, going somewhere and back, and I would just say that should be separated from the bus, that we need a van or a car or something, I would think would be a policy that we should have in effect. Just to, so there's never ever somebody saying there was a gun on a Queen Anne's County bus. In fact, it is illegal yeah. for okay. firearms to be on school property. Okay. Yeah, Mr. So Connolly no has, a, has a good answer to that, because that was obviously one of our first, one of my first questions. So how do you keep the firearms away from the school? And, and, yeah, and can't be know. on property, but I mean, but, but, but concerned me was when I hear a bus and all of a sudden somebody's bringing their gun on the bus. The, a bus is yeah. property. Oh, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Fine. Sean, if you wanted to address yeah, I that. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I saw that uh, added to the, uh, the presentation for our transportation. I, I don't want any transportation from the county. Um, I want full participation from all the, the students, parents, um, and we would self-transport both to our event, the state championship events, and if the national events would be, it would also be on, on the student athlete themselves. Um, just to defeat that from ever happening, even if it's, it's a, um, just a, a spent shell falling out of somebody's pocket and being on the bus on Monday when students get on there um, for its regular use. I don't, I don't want any any uh, mix-ups like that to happen. So we do not need any transportation. We'll not request transportation, um, and we'll, we'll handle all transportation uh, throughout the and, and if you're meeting on school property, as a team or a group to, you know, congregate and then leave, the guns would not be brought, I mean, they would be in a separate vehicle off property, you know, so bottom the line is there, but there's not going to be a gun on school property. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. No meetings would ever um, be held on school property with any firearms or ammunition, whether it's spent or not. Thank you. This, uh, regarding the liability insurance that Mabe is requiring or had asked for, did they um, reach out to other states that currently have a program like this to find out that that's what, what their standard was, or was there some purpose behind their asking for a double liability, or do we know? My understanding is just to have the additional liability costs, and they've given us some different options of how we potentially could accomplish that if the league and or uh, the range is not able to provide the additional cost for the increase to $2 million. So that's something that we're still working through as well. But I mean, did Mabe reach out? I, I don't say why know at this point. Amount? Did they look at other states to see how they're doing it or anything? We'll yeah. certainly ask that of them. I'm not sure if they have okay. or not yet. Thanks. Sure. I remember last year going through this, and it was a short time frame, and we kind of missed the thing. And I'm assuming that's why we're doing this now, to try to get this for the spring. 
can you give me a little time frame of how, where you need approvals and um, what the expectations are both from your the group and you know what you feel comfortable with on how we can move forward for some advice to the board yes so Sean do you want to speak specifically to when, when does the Maryland chapter when would they require us to have you know an MOU or something in in, in signed so that you could participate you guys could participate in the spring I know the, the dates changed a little bit because of COVID. Um, they, they put out the dates earlier on, uh, I think in, after the fall season ended, and they, had, they just amended those, those dates, so I don't have the amended date on, uh, with me right now, but I think it's the end of February, I want to say February 24th, is when registration begins. That's when we start putting all our ducks in a row and, and getting the student information in the system collect all their certifications or safety certifications, put those in the system so they're, they're all um, ready to go when the season starts. I believe the season starts in March. Um, so we would need Ed to be up front and fully outfitted by March. Okay, thank you. And I know last year it was a real, real tight window. I think we were looking at right, getting it done right when uh, Fresh Trade opened up the business to, to COVID. So um, they, they amended the dates a little bit and they've also um, changed some of the rules in, in signing up uh, because of COVID. Um, now the parents and students have to pay online rather than a, the team pay for the, the registration just to try to social distance as much as we can. Um, and also the, the same thing with the roster. The roster is split now between students who are just registered and haven't um, completed the training. Um, and then once they're completed the safety training, they, get, they move into an active roster um, before you could put anybody on the roster that didn't have the safety training. Now there's a difference, there's a split. Um, they just can't compete until they have the training, so they don't have to purge um, those registrations from students who might not be able to participate at that time. And Mr. Connolly, what is the cost of registration and the cost of the safety training? Safety training uh, in Maryland, um, most of the students that, that did sign up already had the Maryland Hunter Safety Course. Um, um, my son and I took that just, just before um, last spring, before the season was supposed to start. And I think that cost was about $75. If they take the lead safety training, I believe that's $25. That's a little less um, than the Maryland uh, Hunter's Course. But Maryland Hunters is a little bit more involved and gives you the opportunity to do go hunting. The safe course doesn't allow, um, you know, is a legal way to, to hunt in Maryland, so you don't have that benefit. There, the similarities um, in the safety portion of it are, are identical. It's just safe handling of a firearm, and two, the, the, the safe thing uh, takes takes place in two parts. There's a school uh, online test, and then there is a field test that actually has, you have to show confidence with the shotgun and, and all the safety rules, just like the Maryland State Course. Okay, and, and I apologize. Did you mention the cost of the registration as well? Yes, I believe that. So, so registration and safety are together? <laughs> Overall cost we have at $283. That includes your uh, safe certification as well as the uniform, t-shirt and hat, as well as the shells, the ammunition and the targets. So all of that would include everything that they needed for the season. I don't have a registration cost specifically broken out. Okay. And is there any opportunity for fundraisers or something like that for new students who may not have already taken that safety uh, course or anything like that? We're getting some feedback from you. Yeah. We have several businesses, including my own, that are um, 
um, that have already stepped up last year that would um, sponsor the team um, to lower that cost considerably. Uh, I don't want to sugarcoat anything and put something out there that we were going to try to do this for free and then not be able to. So the, the complete cost would be what we had stated, and that's the worst case scenario if we don't get any funding at all. Um, once we get funding, we'll figure out the best way to, um, to lessen that burden on the, the students and the parents, um, whether it's paying for the, the uniforms or the, um, the target or the ammunition, um, how, however it works out. Um, you know, we want to get, get the ball rolling first to get, get um, so we register and then I can start collecting money from um, potential sponsors. Thank you. I have one last question, and I don't want to take this for granted, and maybe it's a stupid question, but all the guns that we use for this are going to be registered with the state of Maryland, with everyone will have proper licenses for them, whether it's at the facility or their own personal guns that they're providing for this. I mean, that would have to be part of the MOU, I'm sure. Yes. I didn't want to take it for granted. We would definitely do that. And there are also policies and procedures through the league that address some of this. So okay. to be part of the league, you um, are signed. Are they required? requesting that um, the teachers uh, be fingerprinted and, and go through the process of, you know, background checks. Is that part of the MOU? Do you know? Or part, well, you know, it's part a of part of who works with our students. So our, they would be doing the same thing that our coaches okay. do. Yes. Okay. And Maryland Hunter safety course is only 1995. So it's a little cheaper than doing the okay. safety course. Okay. I have a question about the weapon. What are they using? Sean, do you do you have a, is, is there a required shotgun or, or, or a range? No, that's um, one of the things that the, um, I relied on some of the coaches from the, the 4-H, um, the range, and from Washington College to know a lot more about this sport than I do. Um, there was one of the students that came up and said, when do I need to go buy a shotgun? And the, the, the other coach actually spoke up and said, don't. <laughs> don't. Don't ever do that until we actually see you on the range and see what best fits you, what, what you're most comfortable with, um, and that sort of thing. So, you know, what is best for each student is going to be different for each student. Um, some of the students already have shotguns, but it might not be the best fit for them. Um, and we'll rely on the coaches to get them to compete a little bit better. Um, any um, shotgun needs to be at least a, a double barrel, so over and under is, is what I use, or a semi-automatic, because you need to be able to um, fire two shells. Um, and 20 gauge is smaller than a 12, but most um, coaches will tell you if you're gonna shoot 20, you might as well, well go ahead and shoot 12, because you're gonna grow up. And you get a little bit more accuracy um, because the shell is a little bit hotter, um, so you're going to break more targets um, with the 12. So if you can handle it, um, and there's a the, the girl from Queen Anne County is probably going to be the um, the hottest one on the team. She shoots a 12 gauge, and she's probably 90 pounds. So um, it, it's really up to the student. Um, you could go out there with anything as long as it, it can hold two shells. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you. And and just just for the public sense, uh, this is quite different from anything that any other public school in the state of Maryland, because there are no public schools doing this. For the public's sake, would you talk about briefly the importance of, from your opinion, having a public school uh, sponsor this act student activity versus going ahead and uh, doing it on your own? Certainly, um, the, the, the four schools that are already in the league, uh, like I mentioned, um, there are private schools, so we would be the only public school um, at this time. Um, when I first um, heard about this league on Facebook, uh, is where I, I saw the link, um, a lot of the comments were from the Eastern Shore, Dorchester County, Dorchester, uh, you know, down near Ocean City in Berlin. A lot of people were saying, I wish our high school had this. You know, I wish you know, we had this when I was growing up. I want to start a team in, in, in Ocean City High School. Um, so that's why I took the, the leap. I knew it, it was, um, you know, it, it's a little bit of a long shot with it being a public school. Um, but 
hunting, and especially waterfowl hunting uh, over here is, is a lot um, more common than it is on the other side of the bridge um, where I grew up. As a matter of fact, the four teams that are participating from private schools are, are on the western shore. They're all using one facility because that's the only facility over there. Um, over here, there's there's you know five or six different ranges we could go to. Some of those villages happen to be kind of closest. They're still in the county, and they're the oldest operating privately run ski, trap and ski range in the country. Um, so I'm kind of proud of that um, to keep that uh, area going. They want to do it um, to keep the sport going as well, get younger kids um, into the sport. And uh, one, of, one of the things I said in the presentation, I think it would be very important um, to show public school, um, you know, have some participation in it to say hey, this is not just an elite sport, that, you know, they're, they're not better than us, they're not smarter than us, they're not more responsible. Um, our kids can do this too, they're already out for hunting. Um, I'd like to discuss the beach. Thank you, Mr. Conley. <laughs> I think another plus for this too, I mean, not every student wants to join a sport or an arts club, but they are involved with their family in hunting and already target shooting. So this is another outlet for some of our students who really don't have a club that fits them, especially here on the Eastern Shore where a lot of families do a lot of hunting. But they're, they're not into playing football and lacrosse and baseball. So hunting is their pastime with their family. Yeah, uh, interest is uh, Maryland's got a club, and Washington College has a club that just went uh, varsity, and uh, just this year, after several years. Well, these are <clears throat> potential uh, scholarships. There are potential scholarships available, yeah. And I know our 4-H group um, always has a waiting list, so it's hard to get into that group. So is it, so So just be, help me be clear on this. Is it that students can't get a scholarship if it is not associated with the public school system? That I don't know. I mean, if 4-H offers it, then they still can get scholarships through 4-H. Well, those kids are involved in a team. Mm -hmm. And that that's, team, what, that's what we, Mr. Correct. Connolly wants, a team. So a lot of those kids from the 4-H team, I know a lot of them go on to some of the military academies or they enlist. Sure. Um, so that's a plus for them to have that on the resume. The kids who are on the wait list who never get an opportunity. So are you thinking loss. that, so if we have a team that could relieve some of the pressure from the wait list? It could. Okay. It could. These kids could actually get a chance to participate while they're waiting to get into 4-H or this could balance their group. You could see a lot of those because they could start at a younger group or a younger age group. Where I, you're finally getting some high school kids who have been on the wait list for a while. And if I can speak to uh, the scholarship um, real quick, one of the things that I, I met with the, uh, the board at Sutlersville, two members of the board are coaches at Washington College. And they spoke to me about scholarships. They were really excited about having a team in the county that they could possibly scout future um, students receive scholarships. They're building their team at Washington College to compete with teams in the Midwest um, who have years uh, on them, a little bit stronger team in, in, in Nebraska and Kansas. Um, that they're trying to get to increase, I should say, their their scholarship potential for students at Washington College. Um, that's just one of the schools that, that would be looking at these students. The Naval Academy was mentioned, um, Delaware, um, University of Maryland also has a team, and they all provide scholarships. So this is another scholarship opportunity. I, I know we've had some students who are not in this, probably within the 4-H, doing a small bore and air rifle shooting that did get scholarships down to some of the southern schools down in, in uh, there. So I think it's an opportunity. Also, I think it really shows an ability for safety and respect of firearms and gives kids that maybe students that don't have an opportunity that live out on a farm or something to be able to shoot. And uh, these are, you know, skeet, so it's not, it's not, it's a light load. It's not like you're shooting a deer. You're shooting you know skeet so it's a seven and a half up to a skeet shot so it's you know a, a lighter load so I think it teach a lot of kids a lot of interesting things 
And, and sorry, Mr. Connolly, one last question as I'm thinking. Did you say that you were able to um, figure out the $2 million uh, liability insurance issue? You were able to work through that? Well, I do know um, there is two different insurance policies in place. One would be through the league, which is a million dollars. Also, Sutlersville also has a million dollar policy. Both would name Queen Anne County as additional insured. Um, Sutlersville already provided a uh, COI with that uh, additional endorsement. Um, the league will do it once we pay a small fee, which I would be happy to pay out of my pocket, but um, I want to keep before I do that. So that, I think, um, does you know, cover the $2 million that was requested by MAID. Um, but uh, again, I, I need to defer to uh, make the board. And that's where our discussions with MAID, they've indicated there may be some other ways to handle that that they would be in favor of or support of, and those are the conversations we're still working through. When can MAID give us those answers? We're in constant contact with them, so I think as soon as we're done here and we see that there is support, or if not support, we'll continue that conversation. And I would think that can happen very quickly. Okay. So what? You, but what you're looking for to see, or not? What is brought up is support from this board to proceed. Yes. Well, actually, this is a student activity which falls under the purview of the superintendent. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll we'll get all we'll we're still running this through legal, um, and I've gotten some feedback from legal. We'll have another conversation with uh, Mabe to make sure that all ducks are in order, uh, if you will, and uh, and we can be back with you. I'll, I'm going to give a target of toward the end of next week, Mr. Connolly, and then and then we can and then we can start talking about some um, some uh, revisions that we'd like to make to the MOU. Okay, very good, very can, can, good. Thank, can, can. thank you so much for your time and explaining all of that tonight. Because while this is common for some of our community, it's not common for all of our community. And it's important that everybody understand, particularly, and I don't, I don't uh, take it lightly at all, that Queen Anne's County would be the first public school system to have a team such as this. Uh, it's, it's, we're skating on real thin ice here, and I don't want to sugarcoat it, not one bit. But I have great respect for the culture for Queen Queen Anne's County and the Eastern Shore, and I want to ensure that we are giving opportunity to kids, uh, all kids who who, who would uh, enjoy this sport. So thank you. Thank you very much. And to, to add, just as far as transporting the firearms, I mean, you may want to involve conversation with um, your local police department on what the regulations are about. Um, you know, the owner of the gun should be with the weapon and those kinds of things. Well, I think they'd have to be all state and county reg state regulations as far as transporting of, of firearms. I think that's probably a federal um, thing, but that would be, I think. They could answer a lot of those yeah. questions, yeah, though, about who and take should. Class. They, they give you that information when you take your safety classes? They do, but when you take the safety class, the parent has to be there at the class. I've been there through it. Um, I could have taken the test after sitting there through that. Um, and f to buy the gun with my son, my husband had to be there with him. He can't buy it. My husband had to. So as far as transporting it, it's actually the property of my husband, not my son, who would be on the team. So just to clarify, and when you have a policy or whatever that goes along with this activity, there needs to be clarity about the weapon, how it's handled, who's handling it, transporting it. That is correct. Specifics. The, if the owner of the gun is has to be on site while it's being used. Correct. So those are the clarifications I think law enforcement be able to, or hunter safety, whomever, DNR. I'm sure Washington College and the other schools have to follow the same protocol, so that would be something we could look into. Dr. Kane, could you, next week when this gets through and you find out how we're proceeding with this, just make sure you copy the board so we sure. st can stay up on it too? Sure. Yep. Okay, okay, thank you thank so you. much. I know there was a lot of work. We thank you for all of the research and the time you've taken to do that. Thorough job. Thank you so much, both of thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Can I ask one little question, Dr. King, thank Mr. Harding, while he's here? Uh, have we thought about eSports? 
yes. club? Yes. Um, admittedly, I, I'm, I'm no expert in esports, but it's it's a, a growing entity. It's huge. Um, I, I attended a webinar somewhere in the last month, month and a half. I'm in contact with uh, Play Versus, which is probably, in my opinion, the best group to go with if we went that route. Um, and then now it's just a matter of uh, we held an interest meeting actually for esports, okay. probably right around the same time we held an interest meeting for here, and we had uh, just about 100 students attend an after-school event, which was impressive, uh, to include some of our best traditional sport athletes who also were interested in doing both. So I think we owe it to, to look into it. Um, the only reason I ask is uh, my daughter is the advisor in Loudoun County, and one of her teams won state, and she has two nationally ranked players on her one of her teams. So and it's huge. So, they're getting they're getting scholarships for esports. Yes. Wow. So I, I actually may re, I'll reach out to her. I, I mean, yeah, would, it's because really what I'm what, what, what I lack in this is any expertise or or you know with the esports, but it's certainly something that uh, they have well set up. I'd say based on the webinar and something that we could put in place quickly. Um, quickly. Uh, so. Yes. Thank you. I have one more question. So this falls under the Maryland State Sports, whatever all those letters stand for. Winter sports, from what I read on Facebook, have already been canceled. I don't know. I never got an official. I saw on WBOC the news the other day the Bayside Conference has canceled all winter sports. Yes. So in so in response to a end of winter, so MPSSA set a, an end of winter date of February 13th, which is also the start of fall sports. Mm -hmm. um, so you have you're required to have 20 days of practice once students begin. So mathematically, the Bayside Conference, um, which I'm a part of, factored in and, and realized we've we've run out of time, uh, and we very much want to preserve the fall and spring and hopefully uh, provide those athletes with those opportunities. And this club would fall under that? It would not, though I did, at Dr. Kane's request, I did speak with Andy Warner, who was the executive director of the NPSSAA, uh, and, and he he assured me there were no Comar regulations that he was aware of that would um, prevent a starting of a club, um, and he, as he has throughout COVID, encouraged any opportunity for student engagement. Um, you need 40% of the state of Maryland high schools to be participating in a sport for the NPSSAA to provide governance. Um, so clearly if we're the only public school, there's, that's, we're nowhere near there. But if it did get to a 40% number, it would go to vote. Um, and uh, so though if what I would say is if we, you know, not the first year, but how we've handled other, other clubs uh, respectfully, our athletic boosters organization has welcomed them after they've, after we've seen it's been an established club for a year or so, it doesn't need to be that long. They have extended the offer to, you know, for scholarships and, and varsity letters and things like that. So I would assume if this thing got up and running and, and maintained itself, that that would be the avenue they would go first. So if spring sports were not a go, this could still happen? Or would it proceed along with the other spring sports in all fairness? I mean, how would you, how would you do that? I think we need to have some conversation about that. That's one reason why we, we just aren't ready to make a decision right now. There's so many things I think that we still need to talk about in terms of details and, and, and policies that may need to be put in place in that. So we're still working on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but you're telling us your the deadline looks like to me the end of February would have to have some concrete yeah, Mr. Conley, I think it was February 23rd or 24th. He said the 24th begin registration. registration. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I did, if we can't make that date, then basically we're telling them we're not going to be able to do it. So, I'd like to sit there and move this along if we can, you know, find out what we can do. Sure. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Okay, moving on for discussion uh, 301, opening of schools. Do you want to start off? Or how do sure. You um, we met with the county commissioners yesterday in a collaboration meeting, and we did talk about the January 28th start to schools. Um, 
and you know there there is some you know apprehension on the part of of our teachers as you well know we do have some staffing concerns as i mentioned the last time that we talked and those concerns have grown but before first i'll, I'll start with our conversation with principals today so there were there were a couple of things that happened at during the vote which um i, I don't think that um had uh it's just conversation or consideration particularly this notion of full day. Um, it, it is simply, we did not have a schedule, a hybrid schedule for full day, and, and we knew that. But we thought, let's see if we can work that out, and it appears that it is not a doable thing. Our elementary schools overwhelmingly are not able to do a full day. Uh, overwhelmingly, our schools in general are not able to do a full day for a number of reasons, and one is because teachers have to have a duty-free lunch. And if children can't convene in large groups in the cafeteria recognizing six feet social distancing, then where are they gonna have to eat? They're gonna have to eat in the classrooms, which means a teacher is gonna have to be in there with them and they aren't getting their duty-free lunch. So we've got some concerns with that. We've heard from the teachers union, as I'm sure that you have heard as well, and several of our teachers are concerned. Um, but aside from, th that is the major, that's the major, the schedule is the major issue for every level. Um, and, and, and we talked today and we're not seeing our way through a full day. We can do a full day at, um, at Sudlersville Elementary and simply because they had created a full day schedule back in the fall with consensus from 100% of their teachers. So the situation is a little bit different at that school. Um, so that's, that's where we are in terms of the full day. Our teams, our principals met today and they are working through their schedules and they're letting us know what their staffing looks like. And essentially what we're looking at is we have 39, we have 34 confirmed ADA cases, we have nine pending, so that's, um, and then we've got eight FMLA, we have a few leaves of absence, we had two resignations. So we're, we're looking at a number of classes and, and parents wanna know this, parents I do understand one to know if their child's teacher is going to return to school. Well, I can tell you unequivocally that we've got about 51 of them that will likely not return to school, which means that when their children come to school, they will be sitting in a classroom with their teacher at home. So they're still gonna be learning virtually. Now, the second half of that problem for us is that we don't have enough subs to cover all those classes. Um, as hard as Ms. Bass and her team are working day and night to try to get subs to cover all of those classes, we are still coming up short. Now, even if we put our paraprofessionals in some of those classes that are empty because their teacher is at home because of a doctor's note or whatever, um, we still are looking at an issue because now we're using our paras as subs and our paras won't be there to support student learning in the classes, which is what they're being hired for. So we've got a real serious staffing issue that we have to uh, pay attention to. As we mentioned, um, we can manage the PPE. We are still trying to better understand the burn rate, and once kids start to come back to school, we'll have a better handle on that. But we are stocked with PPE at this point. Um, we're not concerned about that. And as new dollars come in from the state, then we will continue to replenish our PPE supply. We have gotten consensus, thank you Ms. Pullen and um, Margaret Ellen, Ms. Kay, we have gotten consensus from our LLC, our bus contractors, that they will certainly uh, be working with us. If we needed to, prior to this conversation, the high schools needed to make a, an adjustment in their dismissal time, and the LLCs agreed to do that, and that would be an 11 o'clock dismissal time for high schools versus uh, 12 and a one o'clock, which is our regular tier one and tier two dismissal time. So they, they've agreed to, to, to manage that, but the full day is creates an issue. We can manage food services, um, whether it is full day or a half day, as the original hybrid schedules say, because if it's full day, they can serve and it'd be great to give kids hot meals. Uh, they can do a la carte, which they really are excited about being able to do, but it, 
issue becomes where do you house the children so that they can eat um, and still be six feet apart and still be supervised. So that, that becomes an issue, although the provision of the food is not a problem whatsoever. So we've got some transportation um, that's squared away. We Our PPE is squared away. Our um, staffing is absolutely not squared away and our scheduling is being, is, has to be revised. So principals have not sent out another schedule to parents. Mm -hmm. Principals have not said to parents, Miss Smith is not gonna be here um, when your child returns. They have not done that. We have consulted with legal counsel and from our understanding, we certainly can say, Miss Smith will not be in school to teach face to face with students. We will not be at liberty to say the reason why, but we can let parents know that Miss Smith will not be in school in person. Now, we are still waiting, like I said, on nine. We have nine pending cases. We have eight new FMLA cases, um, and we have a couple of leave of absences, two or four. I can't remember which one, uh, Miss Bass. How many? Two. two. Two leaves of absence which means then, you know, more teachers not in classrooms. So, you know, that's where we stand right now. Um, and, you know. Dr. Kane, real quickly, how many long-term and short-term subs do we have currently? 40. Uh, you have 41. Is that but that's only both of them combined? Got Was that both of them, uh, Ms. Bass? Was that long-term and short-term together? Uh, we have 41. Yeah, both. Uh, however, only 12 have committed to doing anything for us, short or long, and we need eight. We know that we, you know that we want to invite back, but they are thinking about it. Miss Bass, can you come to the microphone? You when, might need your notes. When we talk about these numbers, some students or parents will choose not to come back and want to stay virtual. Mm -hmm. So we can't, those numbers that, you know, we're not going to come back with half our classes all the time because there's going to be a certain percentage want to stay virtual. Yeah. So we've already, we figured that in. We know that number. What, what, what? No, we don't know how many because some parents are, we've not put a survey out again and we won't put, so I believe one of the high schools put a survey out that did not come from central office and that's fine. But what we've not been able to provide parents with is whether or not their child's teacher will come back. So we did get legal counsel um, opinion on that and we'll be able to, to provide that information mm -hmm. to parents. And then we'll get an updated uh, accounting for who's coming back and who's not planning to come back. Because I'm sure some parents will make that decision based on they'd rather their child follow the, the teacher. Sure. If, which way. So if this teacher's not coming back, then if they have 20 students or 10 or whatever the number is, that probably, that teacher will probably retain 80, 90 percent of them. Where a teacher's coming back, you know, it might work out not as hard as we think sometimes. I mean, to make it work, it could only get hopefully a little better. I mean, I know it's a challenge, but I would think that would be so much of a help. Hey, Dr. King, if, um, if we can't do a full day schedule, like you were saying, and it, I assume it's going to be half day for the students, you know, up to lunchtime or after, however it's going to work, is it possible to prioritize prioritize the classes so that if the kids that are coming in for in-person learning, we're focusing on the math, the science, um, maybe English language arts, whatever it is, um, and those things like Spanish, although I love world languages, studied them when I was in high school and college, Spanish uh, class, um, perhaps, you know, the music the classes, the band, et cetera, would keep going virtual um, instead and, and focus on those those skills. I mean, is that possible or is it reasonable to, well, to try to do that? I think what the real issue is, is which teachers are not coming back. I don't think it is a content area in particular, but say, for example, we have eight teachers at one school that are not going to be in the school building. In another school, we only have one teacher that's not right. coming back. In another school, we have all teachers coming back. So it's not a matter of the content area. It really is a matter of which teacher are coming back and which teachers are not. Because once you get down to it, we are required by law to provide instruction in all of those areas. So, um, and we're gonna require that teachers, all teachers return to school. So that information will have to get sent out to teachers so that they know that they have to come back to school unless they are on an approved uh, leave 
approval or ADA or something that says that they cannot come in the building. Two other questions. Um, you mentioned Sellersville did make a full day schedule. Are you going to let them proceed? Absolutely. On full, okay. So if other schools can... As we go along, and we and we had that conversation. In a row and a absolutely, excellent, good. And uh, you know it, that Sudlersville can do that is is a fabulous thing, but that is not to put some level of pressure on no. other schools and other you know and other teachers that are simply not able to do it. You know, if they yeah, can't no, do it, we get it. I understand the logistics. I do get it. Speaking of that. Um, there was a lot of communication going on <laughs> since uh, last week when we voted to go on the 28th. Um, it, there's a, a lot of parents, a lot of teachers were, you know, for moving forward on the 28th. A lot of them are not. Um, there seemed to be one recurring uh, idea, and that was because the vaccine, we're going to start vaccinating the teachers next week, right? They're, they're in line, I more or less. The link went out. The, the, it, the link will go out tonight. So we got word from the health department earlier today that we are able to send that link out. And I'm probably getting a message right now to tell me to stop talking, but that is what I know. <laughs> um, and to my understanding, the um, access will open on Friday. And out of about 750 that returned the survey regarding whether or not they would they uh, get the uh, vaccination, the we had, what, about 690 that said definitely they'll get it? It was around that number. Something 636 like yesterday. It's probably, I'm sure it's more today. And that's not all teachers. Correct. That's okay. staff. All right. employees. Good point. Yes. Okay. And just, just so that everybody knows, because I want our <laughs> bus drivers to understand that they are eligible, they fall into 1B, whether you are a Queen Anne's County employee or a contracted employee. Bus drivers, custodian, you are 1B as for educators. So you fall into uh, that category and you can be vaccinated. Is this still where we're having the, stu the, the nurses from the schools? Are they still going to be taught? with yes. an EMT person on hand, and then they're going to vaccinate their individual schools. Is that what the uh, plan still is? Yes. So our nurses, uh, 12 have been vaccinated so far, um, and I believe that is the full extent of our nurses who will be vaccinated. My, yeah. my understanding is next week the county will be running sites that will be doing vaccination, and they will do our teachers at those sites. Correct. So because of the safe handling of the vaccine, we will not be doing that ourselves uh, or won't have it in our school location. So we'll be joining the Kramer Center and the Kent Island Volunteer Fire Department so that our employees can go there. And our nurses and will And our help. nurses will be there. I mean, you know, this is, uh, it, 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 there's no per Perfect answer, and it's you know we've been inundated by concerns, and rightfully so. I, I I agree with a lot of people that you know have concerns about this. I think though we need to move forward. Um, I think we are making good progress. I mean, I, hopefully these numbers will start to come down. They're not they're high now. I'll be the first to admit that. And our vaccinations will start next week. Um, our nurses today and the next week. So I'm very encouraged by that. Um, do you have any thoughts on what how I mean? Our teachers are responding to that. I mean, they. Yeah. So of course, just like you, I get a lot of emails <laughs> <laughs> from from our employees and and there is a and parents as well. So let me be clear on that. There is a grave concern because All our employees numbers, seem to be parents too. And many of them are. Some of them are aunts and and what have you. But. Um, Obviously, our numbers, our metrics are higher than they've ever been. And, and we're talking about opening up schools. And so that creates a, a, a great concern for a lot of people. Um, you know, what would, and, and this wasn't what you asked me, but since I'm talking, I might as well go on and say, what seems to make more sense to me would be to start with our small groups again, get our teachers back who can be back, start with our small groups. We do have all of the, and this answers a question that you all have about the devices, are all of the devices handed out? And so the answer is yes, all of the devices have been distributed. Chromebooks are out. In Correct, the that are out. Um, the webcams are being still being installed, and of course the goal is to have them installed by January 28th. Mr. Combs is going to put a schedule out so principals know if, they haven't, if their school hasn't had theirs installed when they fall into the calendar to be done. So we'll get that out to them. 
But, you know, a lot of parents are concerned about what we just talked about, and that is, okay, so you want me to send my child to school so that they can learn online for a teacher who's at home. And that is the reality. But aside from that reality, my greatest concern is not having a staff to cover the classes for the teachers, who, you know, because I can't have a room full of kids, even though it's 10 or 12, with no adult in there. And I don't have the staffing to cover those spaces. Dr. Kane, any indication if the teachers get their second vaccination? What's the, the wait time, Michelle? Two weeks? Let's say they get days? vaccinated next week. It's 28 days or greater. The vaccine we are now distributing is Moderna. Okay. So it's a 28 day or greater, but not sooner. So let's say they get vaccinated next week. So you're midway through January now, four weeks later. 15th of February. You get second dose. Then you ideally want to give that two weeks to build immunity, just like a flu shot. You need about two weeks to build immunity. So that puts you to the end of February. March 1st. That, mm -hmm. March 1st. Yep. So I think it's doable to expect a greater response and a greater protection by the end of February. Now, Dr. Kane, would that influence your teachers at all? Is that a factor if they can? People are mentioning the vaccine. Um, teachers and parents are mentioning the vaccine and whether or not we can wait until everybody's been vaccinated. Clearly, everybody isn't going to get vaccinated, right. but we have, you know, at least half of our employees who have said yes, they are interested in, in becoming vaccinated. I think that that would make um, some people m much more comfortable. Um, but we, we do realize, and, I, and I'm not the medical professional, but I've been listening to the same thing that everybody else has been listening to. We do realize that somebody's going to get COVID, right? <laughs> Whether they've been vaccinated or not. But if the COVID vaccine does what it's supposed to do, it won't be as full blown um, as, as if they hadn't. So it protects not only you, but it protects the community, which is what we're looking for. Um, and your bus drivers, I mean, you, you have some bus drivers who are in that one B group who have major concerns about bringing children on their buses because they are a more at-risk group. Now, when um, we discuss small groups, staff. Uh, I'm sorry, Michelle. No, and your custodial staff. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So when we discuss small groups, give me a better idea of what we're talking about. So when we talk about small groups, we're talking about students who, for whatever reason, need to have face-to-face -face instruction. Most importantly, we're talking about students who have needs that precludes them from getting instruction at home or, or virtually, right? Special needs IED. children. Yeah, it could be because they IED. have an IEP. It could be children who just, even if we are, we can give away a million hotspots, but if you can't get a signal in your house, you don't have internet. So we're talking about children who don't have access to the internet. We're talking about children who just are not engaging virtually. Sure. So, so we give principals a lot of latitude when we talk about small groups. And, and a lot of principals have done a great job extending to students with IEPs, students with 504s, students who don't have internet at home, and students who just need to be in school. So if we were to start with small groups, would we be able to start with small groups on the 28th? Is that doable. Yeah, we could do that. And then how and, long In fact, you... we, we have a handful of students who receive special needs who are coming now. Already, yeah. And, and we have been working with some parents to have some come next week. Uh, so we can start small groups. We need to get our teachers in to start small groups. And we need to allow principals an opportunity to get a handle. They're supposed to, by Friday, get with Miss Bass and, and we'll make sure that we have a full accounting up to date as far as doctor's notes go for who will be in school and who cannot be in school. All right, so the million dollar question, if we start small groups on January 28th, and I, I, I realize the metrics and everything else, but as far as, you know, the safety measures that are recommended by the Maryland board and the, and the federal agencies as well, um, how long before we can go to uh, the half day hybrid? For example, another two weeks out, maybe, or three or four. I mean, what do you feel? I they mean, give them more and I know time you don't or? know because things change, but something to be comfortable because I'm really worried about changing just too many times because people need to know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, my suggestion would be to start small groups 
immediately, mm -hmm. you know, next week or as soon as we know. We've got to make sure we have a handle on because small group still means teachers have to come into the building. Um, so we've got to get small groups started. And I would think that we get our as many people vaccinated as we possibly can over the next couple of weeks. We know it's going to be a month. We're talking 28 days before they get that second vaccine. Um, and then we're talking we're into now at that point, second semester, right? In the middle of February. Then. Yeah, we're talking to, we're talking March because they still have to get their second vaccine. Um, you know, so that, that that's... So they can get their second vaccine mid-March, mid 28 days. Correct. Right, from next week, give or take. Um, I'm sorry, mid-February. Mid mid-February. Right. Mid mid and even after second dose and immunity, the mask mandate, unless the governor says otherwise, is still in effect. Yeah. So is six-foot distancing and and those kinds of things. So right. those safety measures would still be in place. Absolutely. Unless the governor says otherwise. But just vaccine-wise. Um, and I know you got that another two week buffer period, you know, that you discussed afterwards to let your immune system build up. But um, so, you know, we need to talk about it a little more, but February 16th could be a, at least give you a two weeks, two and a half weeks. We need an opportunity to get people in the building because whether we said February 15th or March the 1st, if I got classrooms where kids are coming and and no teacher is there, I still have a problem, right? Right. So we, we, we have to work on that staffing issue. I, I would think that that is probably above and beyond any concern that principals have today, is that staffing piece. Okay. If, if we, and we are, sounds like we are doing some small groups and open it up on the end of the month for small groups to start getting in there with the principals, would, at that time, after we see how that's rolling out, would the middle of February be reasonable to move the opening date for the hybrid programs, or I mean, or do you feel that's a little too tight? Or? So, so let's let's think about what, what the reason would be. Mm -hmm. You're hearing my concern is staffing, and yeah. I've got to work, we have to work on staffing. Mm -hmm. And and perhaps if teachers, you know, are getting vaccinated, then their doctors will release them. I don't know. I understand. Right? So I don't want to pick an arbitrary date like, you know, February 15th when I don't know what I'm going to look like in staffing. What I would suggest is that we come back to the table, and if, we, if we're going to make a change in the start date, then we make a change and we say what we expect to happen during that change. We expect that our teachers are gonna get themselves vaccinated if it is their choice to do so. And then we expect that we're going to have, hopefully have some subs that wanna get themselves vaccinated Absolutely. if it is their choice to do so and work on the staffing issue. We understand how to do small groups. We've done small groups. We understand the safety precautions. We understand the transportation. We know how to do that and we can do that. The issue is the staffing. And so I don't know what that's going to look like. I, 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 yeah, I, I We're understand. thinking, though, by the end of Friday when they get back to you. So that's probably information that we'll have maybe Monday morning for us to, uh, to take a look at. Well, actually, the principals will be getting notifications of the ones I know now, which ones will not be returning to the building. Each day at the end of the day, I add to the list. Because just keep in mind, if they get the booster shot, second shot, there could be some residual effects. So then I've got day-to-day -day absences on top of whoever's not coming in the building. And please remember, I do have new babies coming into the world. Everybody don't know what you mean when you say babies. Who are you talking uh, about? Oh, not our children, babies, infants. We've got children. The teachers are having babies. So they will be out for 12 weeks. So that will, that will, yes, encumber us getting more subs on top of what I have now because that's our regular springtime is really when our teachers have babies. Well, uh, I so. watched the commissioner's meeting last night and Dr. C and he said that the, the people that were getting a shot safe had no adverse react, maybe a sore muscle or a sore arm like you would normally a shot. But that, from what he's seen, has not been a, a, an issue. And what I suggested with this board look at is two dates. February the 15th is President's Day, so we're not in school. So Tuesday the 16th or March the 1st, because I, I think we need a date that we can go at 
and also I think the teachers need that to understand what's going on along with parents because there's a lot of decisions that got to be made with daycare and how things are going. I don't know how the rest of the board feels about this. Um, if we can get up and running, get our, some of our teachers back, get them back in school, we're doing small groups, and then move this out to where we think it is very reasonable. And certainly, Dr. Kane, I understand you've got issues with staffing numbers but um, you know hope, I mean I'm hopeful of things when we start vaccinating our employees and we then get people into it and getting back it could get back more to normal there's still always a chance there's a chance we get to the acme a point of information mr. Smith um, seeing that this is a new meeting we had a motion made and voted in last meeting at this particular meeting we can rescind that motion at this I, meeting did, for let me finish please for the opening of schools on January 28th and therefore we can start with a new motion but I would suggest highly of rescinding last week's motion okay but let's let's get some information I'm trying to get some information first before but we that's do that. fine. I, I certainly understand the procedure is, of rescinding the first motion if we go to another one I'm just trying to get a consensus of this board to find out with dr. Kane what's the best way to move forward in the interest of everybody. Okay, to finish my conversation, I think that by rescinding the vote to open up on the 28th, you are already, you know, the superintendent is already saying that she is working with the principals to get in small groups as soon as possible. That is already underway. We have already done that and she's explained that whole process. By not putting a date on opening, no one can predict if the metrics are going to be fine on February 15th or March 1st. We cannot count on the vaccination of even getting enough to vaccinate all the people that we need in this county, as Dr. C.I. Tullis said last night to the county commissioners. He has no control over the numbers that come in. So we can't keep relying on that. What we have to rely on is our own community. Are they gonna stay safe? Are they gonna get better? And then the metrics will allow us, it will dictate to the system whether we can get open or not. But firstly, we have to take care of the motion from last week. And I, um, I highly recommend I, rescinding it just for everything I just re everything I just stated. I did just want to say one thing. The one thing about having a, a date, um, and since it's not law and we are able to rescind, it was nice to have a date because I do feel as if we made some positive steps forward. Um, I don't know how long the cameras were there um, and hadn't been hooked up yet, but now they're getting hooked up. I mean, I feel as if it was helpful to have forward movement so that um, if March 1 comes and the metrics and we decide that was the date and it's all okay, we are ready to open. Uh, and that was nice. It was nice that we had something to, a goal to look forward to, you know, to move forward. And I don't even think the metrics is part of this conversation. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the availability of staff. I mean, if we're going to have, like you said, babies coming into the world and uh, substitutes going elsewhere and... Teachers are resigning, as you mentioned, and uh, you know, are we gonna have, even if the metrics are like heaven, are we gonna be able to open up at a half hybrid? Or are teachers gonna? Right, and, and, and to be clear, the cameras were not in. It took six months for us to get those cameras, so as soon as they did come in, we started to install them, and, and that was an issue, and that was one of the things that we really felt that teachers needed if we were going to simultaneously teach face-to-face -face and virtually. Right, um, you know, elementary principals, all of the principals feel strongly about those relationships. Now, I mean, we were talking about that back in October. Now it's January. Those relationships are established. We don't want to change children from the teachers that they already have. Some children are doing quite fine with the teachers that they do have. So we don't want to make that kind of a change. But that is correct. Part of the issue is, yes, the metrics, but it is not single-handedly the only thing that we look at. A big part of this may matrix for us is staffing. So is there, I know that you mentioned some 53 or ADA and maybe more will be going that route. Um, and obviously they're not, uh, I'm just not sure, are there vacancies that are open and aren't being filled? You had two teachers resign. Yeah, if you wanna comment on that. Yeah, bad. sure. And I really can't honestly tell any of you all that they resigned because of the matrix. Sure. But if you remember, just the CARES Act went away. 
and we had 15 teachers that was on the child care cares part, number five. That's my favorite, number five. So they didn't have child care. So they worked it through with their families, and they just can't teach virtually with a three-year-old. It's just impossible. So those two, I happen to know that they had to decide on either LOA or resignation. LOA means it won't be a vacancy. They will be able, if staffing and positions permit, to return next year. But so in the meantime, when they do out. go out, it will be they're a vacancy out. that we have to fill because a teacher won't be in the room. Right. That teacher can come back to a job in the if district, might not be the same job, but prevent, provided there's a position available, that teacher could come back to a job. But as it stands now, it would not, It goes back to what we're saying. The children are coming, and it's not going to be an adult in the room qualified passing all background check to be a substitute. Right, it has to, mm -hmm. right. it has to be. Kids. Not certified, <laughs> but somebody qualified through our process we use to bring on adults who supervise children. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Smith, uh, uh, just for, again, point of information, the previous votes that the board had taken September, October, about reopening of schools, it wasn't that the people were voting against opening schools. The members who were voting against the safety issues the, uh, and the... And the, and the, and the staff issues, it wasn't about reopening schools. Everybody agrees we have to open schools. Everybody agrees the kids need to get back, and you know, the, we need to get back to normal when normal is available. So stating here again, we can't put a date on when we can actually get back in. It gives an expectation, and as, as you have seen, all of these parents and teachers and, and community members have been sending us you know, a myriad of emails for good, bad, better, or worse, because we have put a date on it. And the, and the anxiety level, which right now we really don't need any more anxiety, has increased because we put a date out. I'm only asking that this board rescind that vote, work with the superintendent and the school system to as, as safely as possible, and when we have enough staff, we can fully get back open. I'm only asking that, I mean, it's out of common decency and respect. Well, anybody can make a motion to rescind that, and we can vote on it at any time. We get a motion in a second. I have no problem with that. My experience is I think we need a date so everybody, both parents and uh, teachers, know that we are going to, whatever's going to happen, we decide to go back to small groups today, and we'll, we're going to go back to our hybrid program, whatever date, if we change it by vote of this majority of this board, that they have some knowledge and not just sitting there and saying, well, we don't know if we're going back the 15th, the 1st, whatever. And then what's going to happen at some point, I think, we're going to run into March or April, and then uh, you, you're, you're such a short time. Are we going to get anything? For, you know, it could just be a because it's going to take time for transition. These once we start back into school, it's going to take. You know, I mean, they're going to gear up, but it's going to take time to get. I mean, a week before you get your on the ground running because. You know, some ninth graders have never been in a high school. Some first graders have never been in elementary school. Some seventh graders have never been in the middle school. So, I mean, there's a lot of things. And I'm, I, as one member, only one, suggest that we do set a date that when we would like to reopen. I, I, I'm all for moving it farther out from what I'm hearing, uh, especially with staffing and some other issues. Uh, I'm hoping once we get the vaccinations going and some other things, it will come back more and you won't have, you're going to have a problem with, with, mm -hmm. with the, with employees, or not employees, with staffing, it won't be as great. And if it is as great, then we would have to address that issue in two weeks or three weeks at that time. So I don't know if this is what I hear you saying, but I'm going to suggest that we uh, start small group instruction on the 28th, the first day of the second semester, and then we revisit our staffing situation within two weeks after that so that we have a date, a, a confirmed date that we're coming back and we can give you the progress that we're working on getting teachers either uh, back into the classroom or getting subs, whichever, whichever, you know, it is. And when, so I, I'll just ask, when we bring the small groups in, are we also insisting that the teachers return to the classroom who are able? Yes. Okay. So that they can start getting used to 
being in the classroom. So when we did this the, uh, the first time, what we did was we asked principals to work with their staff mm -hmm. and to come to some consensus as to who was going to do what. Again, that was the beginning of the school year. Relationships have been established and people do not want their children to have to change teachers. And so we're gonna have to get some consensus from principals again on Friday, working with Ms. Bass to see exactly who those teachers are and the content areas that they teach to see how we're gonna work those small groups. Because those small groups don't mean 50% capacity, mm -hmm. right? Those small group means groups mean based on need. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the range is pretty wide when I say need. Okay. So I still share uh, Mr. Smith's sentiment there that we should have a, a date certain to work toward, you know, and, and to set a goal to to hit I'm that date. To and you know, we'll reassess as we go along, but um, I think we need to give everybody a date that we're working toward. When you say get a date that we're working toward, are you talking about hard and fast, okay, we're gonna do hybrid schedules on such and such a date, or we're gonna come back to the table and we're gonna do the update and we're gonna assess the situation as it stands at that point? I think uh, opening up January 28th, I wouldn't be opposed to that for a small group. Let's get um, more students that are in there now, let's get them into the school system, get it working, and uh, uh, or into the classroom, and then fix a date to re open hybrid and I would suggest February 16th as Mr. Smith mentioned that's after one holiday Monday right Tuesday mm -hmm. and uh, and and set that as the date to reopen hybrid now we'll, we got a meeting obviously in the beginning of February but I guess we can get together before that we've got another one I believe in, in January and we can reassess and see how we're progressing toward that you know and maybe the numbers are, are going to be falling we're going to be at that point six weeks out from the the cause of the bubble that we're seeing now which is my understanding Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays um, will be farther out from that there is a lot of anxiety in the air you know people let their guard down their personal hygiene practices and everything else not personal hygiene but their COVID uh, protocols back that up real quick and um, <laughs> and suppose you know maybe they're tightening up and uh, we may see a drop um, but I'm not sure how the Department of Health sees that but uh, but it could be but again I, I do think we need to have a, a date certain that we can start working toward just like we did on January 28th mm -hmm. um, things are already moving in the right direction and, and for discussion uh, to Mrs. Harper we would would send the first one but for discussion purposes just right now you feel comfortable getting working as of the mar to January to get small groups the most vulnerable people back into school for I students, do. and then we set a date that we move it out, and then we do have a meeting on February the third, which is three weeks away from right now. That. Um, we could certainly we're going to be getting updates every week on this, but uh, would be bring it back up on February the third to find out the date that we set. If we set one this evening, uh, would be confirmed or changed. Would that? I mean, does that seem reasonable? I want to be sure I understand what you just said. Okay. So January twenty eighth, start small groups, and you're saying the following week have a conversation about where we are at that point. Is that what you're saying? Uh, we, we, February third. February the third. I would. That's the following week. week. Yeah. Is it really? I would sit there and like to start small groups really? as soon as you feel comfortable and can get staff in there. It doesn't have to be the right twenty. It so have to so be what a, happens in February? Yeah. February. We. I would like tonight to set a date for the majority of this board to, to reopen up schools in February, so middle of February or the end of February, whatever it's Point board. of order, Mr. Smith, we need to have a motion and a second and then have a discussion about this. I understand. I'm just talking to Dr. Kane right now and we will have that motion I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Then the third, we could adjust it from advice from how we're going by vaccinations, by teachers returning back to the classroom, because that's, that's gonna be our major thing, I think. I don't know that there's going to be a huge difference between January 28th and February 3rd, um, unless I'm misunderstanding. Well, the January 28th, we're just going back to small groups. Correct. We would not, 
I'm, I'm saying at the earliest we open schools back up on the 16th okay. of February. Okay. We would address it on the 3rd with you and at, at a public meeting. That's and, si and sit there and say, okay, okay we, are, we have, and I'm just, I know we have to do a motion, Tammy. We would sit there and shoot for the 16th for reopening. And if it, that was because of metrics, because of staffing, because of we didn't get enough vaccinations done through the state, we move it farther out if we had to. But that would be something we could, you know, but we're shooting for a certain date. Or we could pick whatever date this board comes to consensus. I'm only one vote. I mean, you know, and, and the first vote we're going to take is we're sending the first one, which I think we got discussion here that we will do that, and but come up with a new plan. These, i tell you what we're going to do. Does I have a motion to rescind our uh, previous um, motion to open up schools on to 26? 28. 28. So moved. I have, that's a motion? That is a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Mrs. Wright, could you do a call? I will. Can I, just to preface this, as part of the discussion, please. We are already in agreement that small groups will be going in by January 28th, so that is a given. We're going to make the next motion. It's going to, we'll, we'll make another motion. Okay, but, but, but we have, you've already gotten consensus. Oh, small, small groups are already in there from what Dr. Kane's telling us now. Correct. And I would hope she would, not hope, you know, she's doing the best she can to get as many people back in school that need it Correct. At ASAP. Okay. So that's So her just part. by just by rescinding this, rescinding the motion that was made at last meeting, mm -hmm. it is not going to stop the ball from rolling. It's not going to stop the buses bringing the students in. It's not going to stop everything that everybody needs to do to educate our children. Just want to make For that small clear. groups. And the regular virtual learning that's going on. I mean. Oh, no. We're going to okay. keep that. We're just going to set a date for reopening okay. schools. I well, just want to make, clarify to the public that this isn't putting the brakes on anything. No. No. Okay. Thank you. To rescind the vote to open on a hybrid on January 28th. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Spinelli? Yes. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Morset? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. The vote has been rescinded. Okay. Now we will go into a discussion on, right now we have small groups in a few kids or students into classes now, right, Dr. A, King? A handful of students receiving special services. And that will grow as we can get people in. We, we can start small group instruction on January 28th. Okay. And just like we did in the fall, we can have teacher, I'm sorry, principals to connect with parents so that we are prioritizing the students with the greatest needs. Okay. Uh, and also the next question is, since we have rescinded the opening up schools, we need either to set a policy or a date on when we would like to move forward with opening up schools in a hybrid situation. Point of information, sir, it doesn't require policy. Well, a, a, a vote, I'm sorry. Okay. And it doesn't really require a vote as long as we all are all in agreement that it would be put on the February 3rd agenda for a, a constant discussion. Every meeting we have, it's a constant discussion so that we can set a date, a reasonable date on February 3rd. If it needs to be February 16th at that time, that's fine. But we give the superintendent and the principals and the schools all a chance to get acclimated to the small groups, see where we are. We doesn't need to... I know you want to set a date, sir, but if we're always talking about it at every meeting, there's always, there's always hope. Well, there should be hope, and there should be a striving and, and goals to meet that. Again, my, my, concern, that. my concern is the anxiety that is induced by putting a date. That I might that is that that there's, Harvard, an there's a lot of anxiety for not putting a date, you know. So there, well, there's an expectation we're sir, about by putting a date. Parents and, and everything else, of course. That's the whole point. It's, it's a date that we're moving forward to. We've got you know a parameter set there, and and there should be a date on there. So we're we, we're moving toward that date. If it comes that you know we cannot possibly do it because the teachers aren't going to come into the classroom, then we're going to have to readjust. So, and and is, that's okay. But is there a possibility to incrementally increase the the um, the students that are coming in, the small groups, starting January 28th or before, whenever you can start bringing them in, um, and say the the next week, you know, or two weeks later, is there at least a possibility that you can increase that? 
So in other words, not only the IEP children, but um, some other cohorts. And we do. That's why when I say we have a wide range, teachers have, principals have a, a wide bit of latitude for which students can come in those groups. It's not just students that have IEPs. It's students that have IEPs, 504s, that don't have internet, and that, like I just said, okay. just need to be in school. All right. um, and, and a lot of that is going to be determined by, you know, which teachers are able to be in the buildings. But absolutely, there's a wide light range of folks who can, can, can be, you know, in that And in the that principals small have that they, autonomy. Yep, that's already been room established, and, and we have not okay. changed it. All right. So perhaps maybe we can take a different approach here, and I don't know if it's even feasible at this stage in the game. So we start with our small groups, and then perhaps the next stage would be to bring in those first-year kids in the new schools, the kindergartners, the fifth or sixth graders, the ninth graders, who have never seen their school before. So go ahead. And give them that time to orient, because like somebody said they've never even seen their school before. So they're a little more nervous, they feel a little rushed and that kind of thing. And then f just phase them in maybe like that, just a different way instead of putting maybe a hard, fast date on things. Yeah, so my, my concern with the hard, fast date is if we keep putting these dates out to parents and teachers, that is daycare issues. If folks have to go to work, teachers that have kids at home and they don't, because once we start back, teachers will not be able to bring their own children into the classroom with them, right? Because those spaces will be for students. So that's going to end. So I'm, I'm concerned with, giving them the 16th and or the third and the 16th and then this and we have the conversation right and we look to see where we are if we are compelled to give a date I would think that we would not want to give a date anywhere close to the beginning or middle of February because it hasn't given us enough time to see what we can do in terms of staffing get people vaccinated more comfortable with what the um, situation is at school and and, and just from, we get the numbers every day. We get the metrics every day. And while they were climbing, and Ms. Moore said, you know, today it actually went down, right? But Mr. Uh, Dr. Ciotola said last night, now we're getting ready to get the New Year's uh, surge. So those numbers could go back up. So, it, you know, it, we're going to play with those numbers. But like I said, the most important thing I'm concerned right now is staffing. I have, I, I want to be able to give everybody an opportunity to get their daycare situation squared away and to get themselves ready to be back in school and and we can manage small groups but um, if we keep putting these arbitrary dates out there it's just gonna set people you know to a new high but isn't it if you give them a if you give it the teachers a date those that need daycare they can work toward that instead of just open-ended and then at the last minute now they're gonna have to rush and find daycare and I would and I would suggest that the beginning to mid February is not going to be enough time. I, I mid, mid Feb, the beginning of February only was a meeting date. That was never an opening date, in my opinion. Okay. The, the only the two opening dates I was going to entertain, and personally, one person was the 16th or 1st of March. Those are two dates. The only thing I was going on is the third. We do have a meeting that you know we could uh, you know, talk to you. Where do you? F I mean, and I know it's a moving target. I'll pick a date. Any of these board members can pick a date. Where do you feel that a good date would be to shoot for? right now to open up school. I know we're going to do small, hopefully we're going to, we're going to get, get to do the small groups from now pushing forward. When do you think would be a good date, to, a reasonable date, if things don't blow up again? I wouldn't think before March. March the 1st or something? And, that, and the reason is because of the days for vaccine. Okay. But you're assuming that if the vaccine is both both sets of the vaccine are acquired by your teachers, then that staffing problem is going to go away. Is no, I don't. It's also going to give us some time to get people in here. And and my my hope, and I don't have a crystal ball, but once substitutes start to get vaccinated, I would think that they would be more willing to be in those buildings. So I think time is going to help with staffing. 
vaccinations, I think, are key for staffing. The they substitutes just don't are one B as well, correct? I'm sorry. The substitutes are one B. They could yeah. be in any. Well, yeah. Yeah. The, the educators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, moving from the 28 forward with small groups increasing as as we can, and then March to first would be a, a reasonable date, and that's only because it's a Monday. Um, would be another date. I'm not opposed to, to naming March the 1st. Okay. Any other discussion? Well, is it feasible if we call it March the 1st and you got the autonomy, if you think you can get them in earlier, then we move toward that? Day, and know. we'll still have conversations. We'll still have weekly conversations. And if things change, if our situation in Queen Anne's County changes, and it looks like we're okay, and we should be able to get more people in, more people being our employees and therefore the students, right. then we, we make that call at that point. Sure. I just want to make sure that we're all clear on that. It, it doesn't have to be March 1st if it looks like, you know, and the only reason we're earlier. Saying, and yeah. The only reason we're saying March 1st is because I, from what I'm Excellent. hearing, you're looking for a date. Well, but yeah, something that, as in your professional, and like, you know, we've talked about this for the last year. It's a moving target. And it is. What, what we're talking about right now, you probably got something on your phone that's going to change something. So, I mean, that just happens, you know. And and you need to know that the Maryland Health Department of Health and MSDE is going to come out with something. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, it, they, they of are. Of course they are. Yeah, we, we had that conversation. It will be it'll be out any day. But, you know, we, we are making it clear that that our decision is not based only on the metrics. Mm -hmm. Our decision is based on logistics in this school district in addition to metrics. Yes. Sure. Okay. Is there a need to do this vote this evening rather than February the 3rd's meeting? I, my, this is, no, any other board members have, I'll keep my mouth shut for a second. No, I'm good, I don't have anything. But you, you, you uh, As long as we are meeting every week, as long as we are meeting every week and we're in communication with the superintendent and she's talking to the principals, everyone has this information. It is helpful that we keep an open, di open dialogue, open thought process that we can move forward faster. I'm all for, I mean, again, all the board members are for this. We all want it to happen reasonably. Definitely the metrics and the staffing issues. There's, I mean, there's no reason to my mind to put a date on it today. February 3rd, you want to put a date of March 1st on it? That'd be great. If it could be March, if it could be February 16th on February 3rd, that would even be better. That consensus though? I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that and I'll make sure it goes on the agenda for February 3rd. That'd be great. I'm, I'm all okay, for it. Okay, what we're gonna, we've rescinded the opening of schools uh, at this point. Um, uh, talking to Dr. Kane, looks like March, to, looks like, it's not in stone or anything, that March the 1st will be our revised opening dates. We will start moving in to small groups in our schools as needed and as get as many people in as we can. Our teachers will be going back from working in schools over the next um, few weeks to be prepared to opening schools. And on March the 3rd meeting will be on the agenda uh, to, to uh, discuss and set an opening date for the Queen Anne's County Public Schools. February 3rd, February 3rd, I'm sorry. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? I think parents, they need to understand no, no board member is opposed to getting children back in school. I have two children in the school system. I would love them both to be back in the classroom. I have one who's special needs that personally I will not be sending back not this year, because this COVID would kill her. So I, I will not do that. I have one I want in school when he's willing to come into school and be as safe as he can when he comes home to his sister. The hateful emails and text messages, they're not warranted. We all want kids back in school. He, just please understand, we also have a duty to protect our staff, our bus drivers of the school system, as well as the older members of those children's families. So it, it's not a light decision. It's not a selfish decision. 
just please understand. Yeah, and, and, you know, I, I think I, every one of these board members are sincere about what we're trying to do for the students and this, this, this community. And I don't think any of us take it lightly about opening schools and putting anybody in harm's way. I mean, it is a concern, and it's <clears throat> something that, you know, it, it weighs heavily. I mean, I've gotten a lot of emails. 99% of them are very thoughtful. Once in a while, you get somebody off the rails, in my opinion, but usually it's they're very thoughtful because uh, they're passionate about this, and they should be passionate because they're our students, they're our kids that need to get back. And, you know, on the other side, there's a lot of kids and students suffering by not being in school, and we can't get them in school right now, and I, I, I can understand that. But we have to sit there and work as hard as possible to get them back when it's safe and we can have adequate staff. And um, February the 3rd, uh, it will be on the agenda. And uh, can I make one more suggestion, Dr. Kane? I've seen some of the school discipline, student discipline uh, uh, policies going back and forth since I've been on the board, you know, for approval and that kind of thing. Um, so the county has had some 1,200 plus private school children going full time, you know, since September. Uh, interesting enough, no COVID cases that were contracted in the classrooms have been reported, although other counties in the, the state have uh, some reported. But so. Yeah, I'm just suggesting, of course, I'm not going to do your job, but uh, discipline might be an issue because if kids are not going to comply with the COVID protocols in the classroom, you know, which some kids don't, you know, uh, adhere to all the school rules, um, you may want to consider uh, how you're going to deal with that um, as it arises, because if kids are, you know, refusing yeah. to wear masks or, you we know, have. kids are. We have, yeah, we've talked about that, and it's a, it's an insubordination, it's a refusal to comply with what the teacher asks, and so the normal discipline actions apply. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not an option. If students are able to have the mask on, they must have it on. Right. And if they don't... We've already spoken with their doctors. Because of the, right. the seriousness, it, you Absolutely. know, action needs to be taken. So yeah. I'll, I'll support whatever There are children who have a doctor's note. Correct. Um, sure. And I think we talked about how they'll be identified so they're not repeatedly mm -hmm. told by a teacher. Mm -hmm. I mean, my child's not returning to school, but I have a doctor's note in place just in case she were able to come back. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about those that have excuses, that kind of thing. You know, the elementary kids are, you know, they do what you tell them. The high school students are more mature. The wild bunch in the middle, you know, the middle schools, um, you know, don't always we, pay we attention. Your elementary will comply better than your older kids because <laughs> they want to congregate and they want to do their social Detent. thing. And, yeah. Right. Uh, but I, I think these numbers have showed because of Thanksgiving and Christmas, people did not socially be responsible. And... Um, it's up to everybody to, to do their part. And they, you know, you're talking about making decisions. They've got to sit there and work with us. We will provide a safe place for schools the best we can. And there's always a risk. But, uh, you know, everybody needs to be cognizant about this. Okay. Uh, the next thing we have uh, budget review. Can we take a 10, 15 minute break and we'll be back? Absolutely. Okay. Requinius County Board of Education. Our next topic will be budget review. Thank you, uh, Mr. Smith. And so we do have Ms. Jane Towers, our CFO, um, connecting virtually. And she's going to walk us through a presentation tonight that's gonna be an overview for some and an introduction for others as to some um, important segments that we'll be looking at as we go through the next several months of uh, budget conversations. And toward the end, she's gonna give you some dates that are key dates for conversations that we'll have. Keeping in mind that if there are questions that say so, and we will add that to our list. And in fact, uh, Ms. Towers, what we did last year, which may be helpful for the board, um, and it is certainly helpful for the executive team, is we sort of log the questions um, and, and responses to budget questions in a spreadsheet. And then that way, board members can always have access to it because sometimes you can't remember that you might have asked that question last month, or now you're looking at it from a different perspective and you want to have a place to go back to. So we'll get that spreadsheet started um, so that we can log sort of like a frequently asked questions, but it'll have uh, whatever questions you want to be sure that we address so that you have a, a log of that, a record of that. So with that, Ms. Um, Towers, would you go ahead and go ahead and get started with your budget um, presentation? <laughs> President Smith, 
for members to yeah, we got a little bit of, it's a little spotty. I don't know if you need to get closer to your um, computer mic. Is this any better? Yes. Great, good evening. Tonight we'd like to review, it's that time of year already, the budget season and cycle. We'd like to review, first of all, um, some background information. As you know, with budgets, the budget ties to specific goals. And the goals on our website are as follows. The academic excellence, goal one. Goal two is safe schools. Goal three is high quality workforce. And goal four is organizational effectiveness. So when we build a budget, we have those goals in mind. Some background on the structure that we have. We actually are required to be the financial reporting manual, and it's broken down into 15 categories, of which we utilize 12. Uh, they're listed here, but we're gonna go into them one by one. So we might get back up on what each of them entails. So the first one is gonna be your administration. The natural benchmark the superintendent's office of education expenditures, uh, business of convert and HR, that's category one. Under category two is your mid-level administration. When we talk about level administration, we're talking your uh, school level, principals, assistant principals, secretaries, and then your central office supervisors. When we look at category three, those are your instructional salaries, instructional textbooks, and other supplies. Category six, we're going to talk about is special education and all costs associated with students with special education needs that are required by school. Category seven is your people personnel, which can help um, prevent and remediate problems with emotional, physical, social nature. Category eight is health services, which are related to school health. Nine, your transportation expenses. Next one is operation of plant, and that's going to be your custodial services, supplies, uh, your school facility. It also includes those utilities of water, sewer, and electricity. Category 11 is maintenance of plant, and that includes the cost of maintaining all those school facilities. And then category 12, your fixed charges, which are your employer contribution to social security, retirement, workers' comp, and so forth. So before we dive into this year, before we dive into fiscal year 22, we look at where we ended up in fiscal year 20. As you know, it can capture more than 554 of which they were broken out here in the bottom left hand corner. You can see that accounts, salaries was over 59 million and so forth. So when we look at the actuals for 20, salaries and fixed charges were 85% of your budget. In fiscal year 21, the budget was 98 million, 288,108. And that represented a, Three million one hundred and thirty thousand four hundred eighty-four increase between your actual from twenty to your budget from twenty-one. That kind of gives you a little background of uh, where we ended up. Twenty once again as a review, and then where we compared to twenty-one. You see the increase from the salaries of one point two, and then your fixed charges of one point eight, which includes your retirement like When we think about this when we're 22, we, we look at um, different scenarios. The first scenario we looked at was what would happen if we was a one percent across the board or a one step increase. In that scenario, two million three hundred nine thousand nine hundred seven. And we'll go into more detail on that and slides. We had budget requests from different schools and departments, totaling 809,835. 
The next one is healthcare cost estimate. This is a place partner. We reached out to both partners for estimate. And it's a little too early. We are going to have thoughts on what they think this is year 22 is going to look like. Another factor to think about in 22 is your hourly minimum wage adjustment. Uh, increased minimum wage, as you know, it's phased in uh, over the five year course. The other items to, to keep on our radar is a special ed consortium. For fiscal year 21, the budget amount uh, was short 123 to two or two. So uh, to bring that in line with 22, we would have to increase it by a total of 100,000. Factoring in the football from 21 and a 2% in fiscal year 22. Also, in consideration for the operating budget for 20. Two, to keep in mind is going to be your public placement. The expenditure this year for 21 was 580,000. Budget amount was 485. From that difference is 433,000. Uh, there is positive revenue to bring into that to increase the revenue by uh, 250,000. So the net effect would be a little over 180 in the budget, 180,000. Another item to keep into consideration for the 22 budget is going to be bus contract per contract increase. This is the last year of their three-year contract. So uh, any increase in CPI, hours their hourly rate increase is built into as well. So they're going to for about 105,000 a year. The governor has not released the budget, so it is not sure the current funded decision. There are eight of them. The current is not fund. Just put on everyone's radar $620,000 in consideration. And then the last item that we were looking at for 2022 that really comes on our radar is COVID supplies and effort. Um, just as a I reference, the red food state numbers have not yet released. And they're projected to be released by on the 22nd of January. So if we just look at the expense side, because we don't know those revenue numbers yet, we're looking at a, all the factors total roughly around $4.9 million there. And Ms. Towers, I think it's important to, to um, clarify that these are some estimates, right? So we have no idea what uh, that the 2.3 million, for example, for salary increases is a placeholder. And you'll go into how you came up with that. We have not negotiated with the unions. This is simply a placeholder if. So I don't want anybody to get excited um, that sitting home watching this. We have not negotiated Negotiated this, we just are creating an estimate scenario. Okay, Miss Towers, I hate to interrupt, but am I the only one that cannot understand anything that's being said? I can't under I can't understand what you're saying, Miss Towers, and is and I don't see the presentation on the agenda. Is there a way for you to send the um, the presentation to me because I also can't see it from the screen? We don't have the presentation. Maybe it's just dark. We can get it for you. She could send it. Absolutely. I'll try to be closer. So, does this help if I move this call? So, sorry, close. You look marvelous. And, 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 you know, sometimes, and, and, you know, just for future, sometimes if you have a headset, that sort of cuts down on some of that in and out a little bit. But um, I'll make sure that uh, I forward what you have, what I have right now. Yeah, we need to get a copy of this presentation in a PDF there, all of us. You want to come over here? Well, I'm going to need to, but it's, I'm just wondering. So I have a question, if I can, about the Kerwin, because um, Commissioner Wilson discussed that a bit last night. Um, I think there's a delay, or there will be a delay in moving forward with Kerwin, according to the governor's office. I, I have not gotten an update. Have you gotten an update on Kerwin, um, Ms. Towers? Okay. No. Okay. Well, 
I'm sorry, you can go ahead. Please continue. And and yep, nice and close up to the <laughs> to the microphone. I apologize for the sound. The next is going into detail that scenario of three million, how it would look for a one percent increase and a one percent in a one step. The top left hand corner of your FTP. Down below, fifty nine point three million in recurrent cost. Here is the current cost of, if you were to implement 1% plus one step. And this is through the different salary scales. So you come up with a 2.3 million at the 1% and one step. If we were to break this down even further, the cost of 1%, Including payroll taxes would be 681,000. The cost of one step, 1.6 million. So that takes it to that two million for 29,000, not We do have a case, case with the four other chapters scale. This is what I represent where the point are. We have 118 10 month students or 10 month teachers. Run at five, or five of them on top of the account. Support for 10 days 56 on top of their scale. The support scale to team, there's 15 on top of their scale. Support is 51, nurses 2.6 on top of their scale, and transportation 15. So looking at the top of their scales, 226 of the rest What if scenario is those people on the top of their scale? We're given a 1% increase, it would be 176,383. And a percent would be 352. If you include the pay taxes, it's to the right numbers. A uh, little background history on the budget request that we're sending out in November. They were sent out to all schools and department leaders, and they were provided either as a need, want, or wish list item. There was over 225 individual requests The CFO reviewed each potential other funding sources in addition to operating. That was shared with the executive team, and the executive team had uh, follow-up questions for the CFO to watch the part of the year for clarification and other possible options. So now we're diving into the request. The request of the elementary school was one kindergarten teacher here at Centerville Elementary, one full-time assistant, one fourth grade teacher, the total request to increase the element people up would be 190,000. For the middle school, one gateway teacher at Summersville, two special ed education pairs at Summersville, and one EL computer at Summersville. So at the middle schools, the total request to increase the training would be better The last one is total request of the high school. It's shown in zero. Uh, this is because we are looking at other sources in the request. On the departmental level, these are the requests for drug and alcohol for medical instructor for health. Curriculum is required from 1356. Yale teacher 
not pulls in in work for the English department. Professional development, school office, after accountability department, high school university, curriculum writing for math, PD for fourth and fifth for math, curriculum projects for gifted and talented program, class for APR and design course, annual support increases, PD restorative. Practice, curriculum writing, licenses, project licenses, shredding computers at all the schools, and then travel chapter for a field trip and athletic trip up to ticket. So the term of departmental increases is the 404,835. And again, I apologize for the sound. And First year, so any questions you have, anything that I can provide further, please let me know. Um, looking at the 20th, all questions from the next presentation. For the deeper job, the five questions from Harrison. Looking at the budget service on the 20th, and then moving out to February 3rd. Revenue projections will have in again. Do a dive on fund balance, maintenance of effort, and the capital cost savings strategy. And then on the 7th, capital budget, if that's okay. Any other adjustments you think? is our first meeting in March to review the entire budget and vote on it to send before to go to the county commission. Yeah, that's what we have at this point. Um, but generally, the county commissioners, we, we like to have it after they do their he budget hearings. Um, but we'll see what the timing looks like. But we are projecting March, yes. Um, the one thing I think we definitely need is a copy of what was just presented to this board. You, it's in your email now. Okay, so I, I had a hard time following that. And, and remember also that we're going to go through the book just like normal. Understand. We wanted to introduce what the categories were to make sure that you understood in general a summary of what the requests were at the school level and at the departmental level um, and what the calendar looks like uh, moving forward with the next few meetings. And, and of course, we'll have your, you know, sort of your questions log so that you can always have access to that. And we'll have deeper conversations about each of the categories and each of the requests as we move forward. Because I think three issues, and we know we have a funding issue. We did do a furlough day last year, which is gonna come back that there's gonna be a cost that was not last year. The use of a fund balance we used last year to balance the budget, which is going to be a problem. And lower enrollment is going to affect our maintenance of effort. And remember, yes, correct. So, so we've got, you know, when we see this budget, you know, we're in uncharted times. We've always been in uncharted times as far as how much money this uh, system needs, but it's going to be uncharted times of what it needs and what's available. Correct. This year, because there's a, there's a couple of things in the wind that, um, it, it's not like it's it's not like the past. Right, and recall that we did get our employees uh, paid money back with uh, grant dollars well, we, for we, that furlough. The furlough day, that, that's true. The, the employees did not suffer on that Correct. furlough day. Correct. But what I'm concerned is they did not suffer, which is good they did not because that was done with COVID money. But this year, we balanced a budget doing that. Fund balance each year. And if we don't do a furlough day next year, we've got to come up with that much more money because that money might not be available this current year. So it's just, I forget what the figure was, 300 or some thousand dollars for was, a day. Um, right. And remember, it was furloughs and reduction of staffing. Right. And yeah, we, we I mean, um, so... I mean, there was. Bottom a, line I mean, is, I, we're not in any better position. We're in a worse position. Correct. Uh, and I just, you know, I, I know we need to see that information, Mrs. Towers.
Cars gave us, but um, you know, it's going to be a, and it always is. Don't, don't you know? But it's uh, um, it's going to be challenging. So, Dr. Kane, I have a question. Uh, this is the smallest amount of. Uh, employee requests that we've seen in years. <laughs> and, and you know, <laughs> but to add on to that, are we going to need more because we have more teachers that are leaving the system for whatever reason? They leave. So, so recall the process. And for those of you who don't know the process, we generally get a, a, a longer list of employee requests from the schools, right? And from the departments. And as a central office executive team, we begin to pare down what we can possibly get from grants, what we can save or wait for another year. So we start to look for other funding. Um, and then we start to look for cost savings opportunity. As Ms. Towers mentioned, it could be from athletics dollars that we didn't spend. It could be energy that we didn't you know, spend those dollars, whatever the case may be. And then we bring to you the request from schools and departments that are prioritized. So you would not, you didn't see everything, but this is a low number and quite frankly, um, the schools know the situation that we're in, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the budget and, you know, if there's no money, why start asking for a lot of things that you know you're not going to get? That's the, that's the wish list. She mentioned some of these are right. Some of these are not wish lists, but things that they need. Okay. For the most part, these are needs and wants. So wish list stuff just doesn't rise to this list right now. Okay. Yeah. You know, if and we what can about, find a way to get it and with using other dollars, then we do it. I think it was Mr. Evans uh, in an earlier meeting stated that we lost 360 kids to homeschooling and, and that kind of stuff. How does that? A factor when does that and so we look at our enrollment as of September 30th and we get a, a, a revenue per pupil right so September 30th we were not down 360 kids we might be down 360 now but September 30th it was somewhere closer oh, okay. to 200 or 250 mm -hmm. so our our revenues our income is going to be based on the number of students we have our enrollment so it is still going to be down um, so that we do have to consider but but what we're looking at or what we're waiting for right now is whether or not the governor is going to do, legislators are going to do anything with maintenance of effort. And that ensures that we get at least the same amount that we got last year based on the number of students that were enrolled. But we don't know if we're going to be held harmless or if it's going to be whatever it is based on our enrollment right. as of September 30th. Okay. We don't have that yet. But, but in previous years, when we have an increase in students, it could be a one or two million dollar increase increase plus above that it, sometimes. It just, it just depends on how many students we have been right. increasing. But, but increasing, when you increase 100 or 200 a year, it, it makes it a little easier with the budget because you can you know, gel it in. Being Even if they go and hold us harmless and give us the same as last year, that's a zero-based budget. We've still got certain costs that are going to go up, i.e., unless we change our health agreement, you know, we're paying 90%. Well, that's a big, I think it was 400000 I think last year it was 600000 um, You know, There's a lot of issues that we're going to have just, to, like I said, to get even without... Some Without anything things. happening, mm -hmm. you're absolutely correct. You know, and some, and we've got contracts like with the bus drivers, the two percent cola and stuff like, or increase with their. I think we had a three-year contract with them. Yes, and this is the last. This year. This is last year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's certain that we, you know, we've committed to that are going to increase our budget, no matter, you know, just from previous commitments. Right. So I think uh, when we get into it, it's going to be. Um, it's always challenging. I mean, it's you know, it's it's a it's a it's a long February. Ms. Towers, thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. So, so the next time that we meet um, next week, we're going to um, give you an opportunity to to send us whatever questions that we have. But we'll go over this budget book, so everybody should have a copy of the budget book. Uh, it is also online if you need to reference it without the paper. But if you want to put your notes in it here, um, and you'll see that we have throughout the budget book through each one of the categories, we list what the actual uh, amount we spent for FY the year two years prior. We put what the requested amount is, and then we put the approved amount, okay, and the difference between between those two, if we're going to ask to increase it or if we're going to decrease that line. 
okay. and we give you a, a bit of an explanation as to what is contained in that line, what we purchase, what those dollars are spent on. So we'll try to make it as transparent as possible. We'll, we'll go through everything, give you an opportunity to ask your questions, and, and you know we'll get to a place where it really comes down to it. We'll have to make those hard decisions about what we're going to be able to fund, what has to wait, and if it has to happen, how many positions will have to be reduced in order to balance the budget. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item would be future meetings. Uh, we will have a uh, work session next Wednesday, January the 20th. Our regular board meeting will be February the 3rd. And then we will follow work uh, sessions with most will be budget on 10th, 17th, and 24th of February. Uh, do any other members have anything to bring up before the board this evening? Okay. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.